I'm Royce Vaughn. Welcome to the uh, WP Crowd. Today we're talking about what parts of uh, writing good code are necessary for going from a being a medium developer to an advanced developer in WordPress. Uh, my guests today are Josh Pollock. Why don't you say hi, Josh? Hi, Roy. <laughs> Josh we is the Caldera for uh, Dragon Drop Sponsor Form Builder. We're also joined by Chris Flanagan. Say hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. You want to introduce yourself? Jokes. You're actually you. Um, I'm Chris Flanagan. I'm a developer for Flowpress, a WordPress agency based out of Toronto. And uh, yeah, I'm here. Uh, and we're also joined by Carl Alexander. Say hi, Carl. <laughs> hi, Josh. Uh, I'm Carl Alexander. I write on carlalexander.ca. Uh, I write about advanced WordPress topics and among other things and also there's a cardboard version of me as Roy is giantly pointing out with stickers that is traveling the world so don't miss out when it comes to WordCamp near you the the sticker is a sticker version of the cardboard version of Carl that's how meta we are yeah. are we gonna we're gonna see Carl board at WordCamp Miami is that the next opportunity that's I mean if Christie's coming then I assume so I think yeah, Caldera, Caldera WP right now owns or has ownership of uh, of Carlboard. Carlboard, right? It is in in our New York headquarters, aka uh, Christie's. <laughs> um, it was briefly like in their entryway of freaking everybody out, and now it's like hidden in a closet. Yeah, it does freak everybody out. That is a standard. I had it in my house for a while. It freaked me out every morning when I woke up. I know it freaked Rachel out pretty hard when she had it. Um, yeah. I mean, note to self, don't put it in the bed with you, but, you know, <laughs> I was a little lonely. <laughs> How many nights did it sleep in bed with you? Well, that's what, like, Sean did for a little while, so, you know. Yeah, exactly. Don't ask questions. You, yeah, don't ask questions you don't want to know the answers to. Ownership of the Carl board, things happen. Yeah. And this is, this is just what happens with Carl board, What happens with Carl board stays with Carl board. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yes, it does, and he can't speak, so he's pretty safe. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm Roy C. Vaughn. I'm the host of this, and I want to pivot back to our actual discussion so we don't just talk about Carl Board for an hour. Yes, this podcast pivots. That's a very, very good thing that we do. So let's pivot. Yeah, ah. Chris is leaving. Not by. <laughs> so we started having this discussion, and then I said, hey, let's just hit record. Okay. And now so so your your point was that there are certain things that um that a developer who's going from a medium level developer i would say like a um a medium rare type developer who wants I'm a vegan, to vegan i don't understand these analogies oh that's true um all right someone who's hacking code in php to go to someone who can write php from scratch let's assume that's, that's what a good, we're good analysis yeah <clears throat> We had sort of started with our friend here, Chris Flanagan, had written this great article on um, going from like hacking some shit because it worked to trying to be a quality developer. And Chris is, is actually a quality developer who I employ from time to time. Can we talk about where his article is for a second? It's on whoischris.com. It's the latest article. Um, basically, just the gist of it, I, I spent 10 years coding, self-taught, um, working by myself, freelance, a webmaster for places and never worked with any other coders. I never had anyone teach me code. And then when I tried to get a job for a, a WordPress agency, um, they slammed my code. They said it was, they were nice about it, but they basically said it's, it's shit. And uh, that woke me up and made me realize that I was a terrible coder. And um, so I made this strides to get better. That's the gist of it. And like and got, a lot of clients are, it, well, you can't sell clean code, object-oriented PHP to a client. Clients don't give a shit, right? Clients care about words. Yes. And so the question is, what are the things that are worth it to you that your client's never going to notice, right? Um, that because you want your code to function, you want your code to continue to function, you want your code not to uh, lead to security vulnerabilities. You want other people to be, or you in the future when you don't remember what the hell you wrote, to be able to work with it uh, because you want to be able to change things without the whole house breaking down, right? Like the difference between, like the simplest definition between good code and bad code is can you change one thing in it without the entire 
like ripple effects that require huge changes and or yeah. right okay, so my 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 interjection here is that do you think that um do you think that um sorry based on the type of developer you are your needs are gonna your what you need to learn changes because look chris works for an agency um i know uh, in the past or maybe currently he takes client work on the side um you are a plug i mean i know you do client work too josh but um you primarily your your like your dream or your kind of like what you want to do is build caldera out so i'm going to classify you i'm going to classify you a, i'll classify you as a premium plugin developer right and i am a i'm kind of more along the lines with chris i work for you know a major corporation and i sit at a desk and i you know i work on other people's code you know, I don't build things from scratch all the time, but do you um, work in your underwear? Because I do. I don't get to work from home every day, but you know, on the days I do. Interjection: I put on pants for this episode. No, I can't. Not me. I put on pants. <laughs> I specifically took them off for this episode. I think I think that's you know I think that's a fair base, right? Like if you want to go yeah. from a medium developer to an advanced developer, uh, take off your pants. Like, like, but I feel like if you're on a podcast, you should put on your pants. I've always everyone that. agrees. Yeah, okay. Everyone, take off your pants. That's you're like not fifty percent of the work. <laughs> yeah, fifty. <laughs> Where I put my pajama pants? Oh, I don't put them on. But I'm okay. So I'm just saying, like, you, our conversation before the, we hit record was that you were saying, "Hey, unit testing," right? And I agree. Developers should learn unit testing. Do I do unit testing on my own little side project? Sure, I do, but not very well. But it doesn't mean that we do it at work, or doesn't mean that, you know, I, uh, you know, we do it all the time. I'm sure in an agency model, because I've worked with agents in agencies before. We don't do unit testing. Who, if clients don't want to pay for the time to set up unit testing, but on a plugin that you're selling to the world, sure, you know, only you're, you're basically the only developer, or it's going to be your team. So I'd understand why unit testing would be much more important to you. Well, I mean, and then that's the thing, like I can rattle off a list of things that are objectifiably speaking important, um, but you can't do it all, right? Like make everything per like solid, solid, right? The acronym solid, make it all OOP because that's more scalable and more isolatable. Test everything, use a service layer, use the hexagonal architecture, right? All of these things that are all good, but if that's your concern, you're never actually going to finish anything in a reasonable amount of time, right? Uh, documentation. I hate documentation, but I do it. But I hate writing documentation in line um, or, or for the client to how to use it. I hate writing that stuff. But, but, but that's like a gift to yourself in the future, right? Like in line documentation when you're like, like I, I remember the first time I had a client be like, hey, Josh, you built this shit like a year ago. Can you add this feature? And I had like documented the crap out of it. And I was like, thank you, Josh. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, yeah definitely. It's a gift, but it's, it's just an, it's one of those things um, when you want to become a better developer, you have to do the things that you don't want to do. I mean, that's, that's the gist of it. You, being a lazy developer is easy, you know, writing code that just, just flies through. But, um, um, wow, I lost my train of thought there. How about that? Uh, Carl's going to pick up your train of thought. Yeah, Carl, pick up the train, please. Yeah. Um, I think you I think you have a pretty good point about the stuff that uh, you don't want to do like if there's a common theme about everything that's been mentioned so far it's that it's uh, it's things that you don't want to do you don't want to unit test you don't want to document you don't want to necessarily think about good variable names or there's a million things right but um, it's really I'd, at the end of the day, it's, it's, some of it is what distinguishes you from like a good or a bad developer. I think from the agency standpoint, uh, the unit testing and all that stuff, I think it's super useful in agency context too. But it's just, it's, it's always a hard sell because you're basically selling time now versus time wasted later. And it's really hard to predict how much time you're going to waste later because let's say you have a, my favorite example with unit testing is like you write a unit test. It takes you like, let's say half an hour. And in an hypothetical universe, that unit test doesn't exist and you don't know something breaks 
and you don't know where it is and you spend like six hours trying to find it well that half an hour costs you less than the six hours but because in the alternate universe where that test exists the test you're gonna fail you're gonna be oh i broke this you fix it in two seconds and then you're done you'll never know how much time you would have wasted without that test being there so it's really hard to sell it like i did management and basically trying to sell unit tests in a management environment with team leads and like deadlines and, and costs and things like that. It's the same as R and D. Like you want R and D in your project, basically overestimate your things by like two or three and then try to get away with it. So you can do R and D while you're developing. Yeah. But you're also making the assumption, especially for an agency model, you're making the assumption that you're going to actually need to come back to this code and uh you know fix it or add to it later on um and how often, let me counter this that. question how often have you not gone back to code that you've done in agency a lot because as soon as you're done with the client the client goes on their merry way and again depending on the agency the agency i worked for i you know if we got a client back it'd be a long time later and no i, I, I don't think i've when I was working for an agency, I'm mean, I ever reworked on a, on a, like a past project that came to the point where I wish I had unit testing, like maybe in the rare scenarios, they came back to add a plugin or something like that, but never, it was like, Oh yeah. Uh, you need to do something. And I wish I had unit testing. I definitely did, but I had like oh, large yeah. Disney scale projects with basically maintenance contracts and st stuff like that. And, Exactly. We have maintenance contracts with every client pretty much. And so, I mean, I consistently go back to my code once a week, every project. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask another question then? Um, which would be like a good starting point for someone who doesn't do unit testing, but maybe wants to get into it. What's the threat? Like what's the, um, what's the functionality line, right? Do you, do you unit test every single thing? Like, Hey, on the homepage, I looped through, um, the blog, the latest post. Do I need to unit test that? Or where's that threshold of like, okay, I should probably unit test this, but this is probably safe to not unit test. I think it's just the bigger algorithms, honestly. Like I, I, I've never been properly trained in unit testing. I've just learned from online. So my opinion is the complex functionality should have a unit test, like things that are going to do a lot of crunching of data and spitting it out. Not every single function you have though, of course, just the, the core pieces in, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, you're basically asking the unit testing version of tabs versus versus spaces. So, <laughs> so it's well, there's a really, there are the holy wars started about this. Like, basically, is pure test driven development. Do you write your test first before you write your code? Do you code everything? How much coverage is a, is enough? Do you want a hundred percent coverage or is like eighty percent enough? And I think Chris touches really the point, which is be pragmatic about it. Like there's really no reason to be dogmatic about any of these, like even OP or anything else. Um, but yeah, the complex stuff is usually where you want it because most of the time that's also where you're going to be like, I can't remember all the edge cases or everything that can break in this, in this code, like whether it's like a grouping of code or like, so it's always, it's always important. And that's, that's usually, usually for starting with unit testing, like you start, if there's a bug, you write a test for it and then you fix it so that the test passes and then you just kind of work your way through there. So you wait for a bug to show up and then you write a unit test for it versus writing a unit test before? It depends. I mean, there's no, like I said, be pragmatic about it. Um, when I'm writing su something super complex and I know what my input is and my output's going to be, then sometimes I write the test first because I, I, at least I can, I know what I'm coding against. Sometimes if it's a bug, then you write the test for the bug, right? Like you determine that the, that the bug actually exists. Like it, it's a lot easier to write a test to test input and output and then fixing it. So it really depends. So I want to make an analogy here, going back to not wearing pants. Um, it's this idea that you should um, dress for the job you want, right? And the job that I want involves sitting around in t-shirt and uh, pajama pants, right? In that 
I also want to be the lead developer of a much larger organization than I have right now. Okay. And I all, on, all, all, and I want to like soon be the lead, the lead developer of a slightly larger organization. And that involves, even when it's small, even when it's mainly just me or when it literally was just me acting like I had a larger team, right? That means single, you know, every commit is related to a single issue. And then you tag it, you know, did this issue number close via commit number in Git, for example. And that's totally unnecessary for one person, but that's necessary for more than one person working on a project. So it makes it really easy to go from one to two people to three people when you've been doing that the whole time. And so I think that this discussion maybe needs to come back to, is your goal to keep writing a bunch of stuff that just kind of works and gets you through the, the day, it gets the job done? Or is your goal to write bigger, more impressive projects that will never get to version one? If you don't follow these things, is your goal to be the leader of a larger organization? Right? Because I, I would argue that a lot of these things really are necessary in uh, like proper Git workflow, right? Do you do that from day one, even though you're just one person? Do you uh, write code for reuse, even though it's, you don't think this code is going to be reused, right? Is that your assumption? Um, <laughs> even if on day one, none of that crap matters. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it really depends on what kind of WordPress developer or developer I would say you want to be. Like the people who hack code and push out a $2,000, $1,500, you know, business website with, you know, 23 plugins installed. I don't know if they necessarily need or want or have the desire to become a developer who can also pick up a Laravel project and get that work done too. Like the, the great, uh, addition, the, the great reasoning behind becoming a better developer is being able to be agnostic to what you're working on. Right. So like being a WordPress developer is great. WordPress power is a great percentage of the internet. But if I'm a PHP developer, right, if I take WordPress out of that title, I now become a person who can work on a Laravel or Symfony or really any PHP project across the board. I can even work on Drupal if I wanted to. Um, and the same goes with JavaScript, you know, JavaScript being the big thing. If you know, you know, one framework, you're limiting yourself versus learning JavaScript as a language and being able to work on anything. So that's funny. I had a, I had a, um, when I was job searching this last time, I had two resumes. I had a PHP resume and a WordPress resume, you know, and I sent them depending where I was applying. So um, it is funny. Uh, even a WordPress agency wants to see that you're a WordPress developer. They don't want to see that you're a PHP developer, you know. I find that when I do like, you know, peruse the what's out there or I, I, I'm sure you guys get this all the time, but I get it constantly. All the recruiter emails. Hey, I saw your resume on blah, 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 LinkedIn. Um, you know, when I take a look at those jobs, if you take WordPress out of the equation, most of the time the salaries are a little bit higher, um, which is fine, but you might, you know, you as a WordPress developer not, might not be there yet, or you might not want to be there. So um, I, I guess it depends on the developer what, and we've talked a lot about this, you know, with leveling up uh, and stuff like that. You know, if you're just out there to make a thousand dollars on a website um, and you can hack code together and gobble up some plugins you don't really need to do unit testing in oop like guilty i'm guilty for those you know $500. okay well let's assume that this is a thing you want to do right let's just stop making excuses and maybe suggest what are it to be useful what are the things that are worth doing right is it getting into separations of the concerns is it better structure is it better inline documentation is it unit test what are in terms of return on investment if you're right if, if you're okay with where you are stop investing in yourself like just go i don't know go go do something else but if you want to invest in your skills what are the things that are going to give you that return on investment in terms of this huge list of things that might be good i i'm honestly i think i've i've we've done a either a podcast or a, a article on this but um get workflow has always been my top priority if i tell anyone hey you want to level up you want to start learning more get your Git workflow down. And if they don't know what Git is or how to use GitHub or Bitbucket, whatever, I would rather teach them how to do that as a great foundation of just being able to get work organized than take the next step in learning some advanced OOP. Like OOP is great and I think it's, it's definitely something you should learn, but if you don't know how to Git then, or you know, 
learn that first. That's always mm -hmm. been my top priority. I can't really disagree with that. No, I, in fact, I put in my article, the number one thing that made me a better developer was working with other people, which meant using Git, you know? I mean, it just, something about that made me just keep, like, constantly seeing other people's code, knowing other people are judging mine, having to understand how we're working together in this Git repo. I mean, that, that shit, that was a very big learning curve, but it also it was the next level. Like, it, it pushed me hard. Yeah, for sure. I can't, I think that's super important. Um, not just, I mean, like we mentioned it earlier, but like you have to code for others, but others is also your future self. So like you have to keep that in mind. Like you're, when you're like working on it right now and it's like really fresh, then it's, it, a lot of it seems like stupid to do. But when you go back to it like a year from now, like all these little things that we take that seem like a lot of work really add up to making you one, your code look good. Uh, but two, it looks good because it's, it's really a, like we focus so much about building things, but like, what do you do m like the most when you're coding, you're reading, like you're reading code, you're reading your doc blocks, you're reading, you're reading what you wrote. So being really good at writing code, I think it's super important, um, regardless of what that code is. I don't really care if it's procedural, if it's object oriented, if it's JavaScript or something like that. But if you name your variables like A, B, and C, I mean, I think you should work on that before you even learn any other tech stack because you're going to work with other people. Like Chris is 100% right. Like most of the time you're going to work with other people and you need to be able to write so that other people understand you, not just yourself. Can I uh, be a cool experiment to, to time? Like if you could, if something could track how much time you spend typing versus reading while during a coding session, I'd be really interested to see that. That a was lot. a good point. Yeah. And I think but, um, I definitely read more than I write. No oh point. yeah. I definitely Google more than anything. <laughs> <laughs> I spend most time Googling than anything else. But so there's, there's been this weird revolution. Um, I think in the past few years where uh, there's been this up, up and coming business model of WP like support, like ongoing maintenance for people's websites where someone who has a WordPress website can pay 30 bucks, a hundred bucks, whatever it is per month and they get support. Um, it just clicked at like dawned on me that like, if you want to become a better developer, try getting a job at one of those places because the best thing that I've done besides Git, I would say, and I know it sucks, like I hate doing it, but if you were debugging code all day, like if that's all you were doing, like debugging an error and then fixing it, you'd probably learn so much more quickly than anything else. Like, absolutely. I learned so much from just my own errors and other people's errors, fixing their errors, that um, if your day job was to actually just support code that you knew like was gonna be broken when you first looked at it, you'd probably learn quite a bit and probably pretty fast too. Learning at WooCommerce and uh, building, building things to extend WooCommerce. And right now I'm building things to extend BuddyPress. I've done both extensively at this point. I have learned so much about uh, JavaScript, um, PHP, uh, objects. I mean, I've learned so much from browsing through the, these giant code bases of, of big WordPress plugins to make them do something I want to. You know, I'm just trying to make it do something. But at the same time, I learned so much reading through that code. It's incredible. That's why I have an article that says, that's titled, Read More Code. Hey, hey, look at that. <laughs> no, it, it is true. Like, I was working on something super, last Super, time. super important. Yeah. It's one of the first things I told Roy when I met him the first time. Like, mm -hmm. But, um... I forgot what I was what I wanted to say related to that, but uh... reading no reading code is super important. Like I was working on something even just last night where um, someone wanted me to do something, and I'm like, I don't know how. Like they were using uh, WC vendors on top of WooCommerce, so it was like a you know people could sell their own products on the site, and they wanted to do something where it was like they updated the commission rate on the fly. Um, I've never used WC vendor. I've never you know used the plugin before, but. Again, knowing PHP, I could read the code pretty easily, right? It's like knowing English, you can read a book in English. Um, so I could read through the code and I quickly found out 
you know, what's, where is it hitting? Um, and luckily, you know, good bass, they have an action or a filter on something. And I'm like, oh, sweet, there's a filter right there. But their documentation weren't that, wasn't that great. But being able to read the code, I quickly said, hey, there's a filter here, I can just use that. Um, yeah, reading code is, is huge. Being able to just sift through it and understanding where to look. Like being able to pull, it, pull up um, whatever you're working on on a GitHub, you know, the repo, being able to search for what you want to search for, being able to find it, then read through that document, you know, that page, even if it's not well documented. Yep. Yeah, so I, I remember what I, so it was about Chris and uh, fixing bugs, basically. Um, I have this saying where, like the difference between like a beginner and an advanced developer isn't how few errors they make, it's how many they make per hour. Because the, the better you are like at debugging, at figuring things out, the, the faster this whole process is, right? Like you won't do a, a small mistake. Like I remember, I mean, I remember the newbie, newbie, newbiest mistakes that I used to do, like in PHP. You forget a semicolon somewhere and then you're trying to find it where like you forgot to put that semicolon because it didn't really quite tell you where, where you forgot to put it or something like that. And you spend like 10 minutes figuring that out. And now like, now one, you rarely forget to do it, but two, like it'll jump out at you like in a couple of seconds when there's a semicolon missing. So it's like all those little things kind of add up and they all come through bug fixing, which I think is super important. Like I love bug fixing. I'm a weirdo, but I love bug fixing. I do too. I, do too. Well, I love a good bug. And I think that's a really good point in terms of like, I remember spending all this time trying to figure out how to like concatenate strings of PHP and like making sure I wasn't missing a dot and like looking at other people's code to figure out how the hell that worked. Um, and then I got like a syntax highlighter because I was stopped being such a noob that thought like, yeah, I don't need any of that, right? Um, right, I don't need a, like I paid $100 for a fancy program that'll just make my colors, buddy. Um, <laughs> right? Right, and, and going on with it, like Royce, like it doesn't sound exciting to say uh, like learn Git, but he's right to like spend $100 on PHP Storm because all other ways of writing PHP are wrong, uh, you know? and get man i still get really scared when i'm in there sometimes there's a bunch of branches and there's staging and production and sometimes man uh, i'm just like i don't want to i don't want to touch this it's gonna break, I'm gonna there's break. A certain, yeah there's a certain level of developer a certain type of developer that enjoys like the hardcore git like i used to work with a guy he, he was on our team at disney who if there was an issue with git he would know exactly like if you've ever heard of cherry picking I would never want to cherry pick anything. I love cherry picking. That's like the best feature of Git. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? I don't even know what that is. Oh, oh wait, don't cherry picking. Just do it. It's okay. we'll commit and move it to another branch. Like, oh. I don't know where that, that commit is. That's scary. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Being able to go from one branch and pick out one specific commit and then put it somewhere else. No, don't do that. <laughs> oh, yeah. It sounds, it's horrible. And it's just, <laughs> and this guy, <laughs> This developer was just doing it all in C, you know, command line, and I, oh man, I, I was like, no, I would never want to get there. But I'm sure so the, what, though, he got it. He understood it. That made him want to do it more and more. You know, if I understood it, then I'd want to do that too. It made me feel like I'm a magician. You know, I opened a issue in Caldera Forms the other day called o o OMFG. Josh screwed up the Git workflow for this last release so bad. <laughs> I shipped it to WordPress.org properly, and then I just like destroyed the uh, Git repo. Um, and Lucas caught it. Major points to Lucas. Um, it, but I fixed it because I'm like, it wasn't that bad. I, like, it was like two reverts, and then like I, I just merged in the wrong direction. But um, like, we all do that. Um, oh, dude, I used to push things on the site I worked with you on before pulling, you know, and screw us all up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I learned my lesson after you yelled at me a few times. I learned my lesson, but. Uh, yeah, man, it's easy to screw that up. Um, so what other things do you recommend besides Git and syntax highlighter and getting comfortable with like, I will, like being comfortable, like Carl was talking about being comfortable with bugs, like not beating yourself up because you broke stuff, right? Like, I'm, like, I, like we all break stuff like thousands of times a day, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And I think like, that's so, something like, uh, and maybe that just needs to be said. If you're going to take the route of, uh, going from medium to uh, well done, um, then you need to understand it's gonna take you a lot of time to get there. 
And there's gonna be a lot of days where you're gonna wanna toss your laptop out the window because you are gonna hit a bug and you're gonna go, where the hell did that bug come from? And bug, bug fixing and, and dealing with bugs is a whole nother like hour and a half long conversation, but mm. it's just something you're gonna have to deal with. And that, I mean, that's where the biggest issue is, right? You need to invest the time and I don't know if everyone wants to do that. And so you have to assume that's gonna take you time especially if you're using a client to advance yourself, which I do all the time, right? Like I use a client to advance myself um, because I'm getting paid for the time. So it's awesome, but it's going to take a little bit more time to do something because of that. If you have a good employer, then they're going to expect you to take good amount of time to do it. Right. You know, like that's why I love my day job. Like I love it. I, they want me to do it right. They want me to document it right. The client knows it's going to take a long time to do but might not seem like it should take a long time, you know, but if we're going to do it the right way, then it's going to take that time. I'm going to document it. I'm going to, I'm going to think of research about it before I even start coding, you know, and, and that, that is just, I love that, man. It's really nice. But then I do a project like know your fro, you know, know your that, that thing I did. I don't have free time anymore. So when I, when I want to do something fun like that, I, you don't want to see the code in that thing, man, it is nasty, <laughs> but it works. I threw it together really fast with the 30 minutes I had at night after, you know, before going to bed every now and then. And uh, finally got it up and launched and it works. And it's a dumb little quiz, but the coach terrible. Like it is awful. Um, yeah. But you know, that's just what I, I wanted to build it. I don't have time. So I threw it together. So I mean, I mean, a lot of my little side projects are also crap code and, and, and they'll get better, right? Like my first angular WordPress theme was, was garbage. And then I slowly <laughs> learned angular better and better. So the angular part of it became better. My Angular 2 theme, I just, I just launched uh, like last week. And I'm sure it's garbage because I'm just learning Angular 2 right now. But it'll get better over time. And that's just something, you know, again, as you have time, you level up. Well, it was, it was because I don't have time. I just wanted to throw it together quick. I didn't have time to set up class structures and, and document it. So I just built a really quick functions file and a header and made it do what I needed it to do. And it's like two pages that go in a loop. Um, but it's just time. It was more just, I don't have time. I want to build this goofy little thing. So whatever, I just threw it out there. Um, I will say that uh, Josh mentioned PHP Storm as being your editor. Um, I highly recommend investing in things like that. Um, I just learned, uh, not like super recently, but pretty recently that like when you have a function in PHP Storm, and if you go to the line right above it and hit backspace, uh, asterisk asterisk enter it does php notation uh inline notes automatically it tells you what parameters the function takes what what does it return and all you really have to do is throw in one line that says this function does this just so there's note on it like really feature. the only reason i take notes inline notes now is because it just does that for me mm. otherwise i yeah no i i don't <laughs> care enough and i try to make my functions names like dumb friendly right like this function does this uh, parentheses like mm -hmm. all right Roy, are we wrapping up here <laughs> hold on two questions one am i wrong again and two should i have been writing code this entire time or was that rude that was rude <laughs> okay that like, maybe it's better that i spent all this time like trying to teach myself more about vue.js but maybe it was rude, and if so, I apologize. But then again, it, it, then it gets weirder because you would think that, like, because I'm Roy, I would be better at JavaScript. <laughs> you are good at JavaScript. You are I'm really, not really not good at JavaScript. Roy is amazing at JavaScript. Uh, okay, so this has been an exciting episode of the uh, WP Crowd. Um, I am your host, Roy C. Vaughn. Um, you could follow me on Twitter at uh, Josh412 uh, or at CalderaWP.com. <laughs> I'd like to thank my guest, Josh Pollock. <laughs> you can follow at Roy C. Vaughn on uh, Twitter. <laughs> That's uh, RoyBoy789 on Twitter. And don't forget <laughs> the WP crowd. Don't, for don't, click, uh, don't forget to click subscribe down below on YouTube and um, check out our other uh, up and coming. Um, what about these two guys? Shouldn't uh, we say thanks to these two guys? No. Yes. Um, so don't forget about the WP Life, our other podcast. Uh, it's a couple episodes in already. And yes, of course, thank you, Chris. Um, you can follow Chris on 
Twitter and other places as well. And Carl, um, you can follow him at carlalexander.ca, right? Yeah. And, at Twig Press. And, and at, don't tell anybody about Chris uh, Flanagan. Uh, don't tell them it's at this is Chris, right? No. Who is Chris? Who is Chris? Who is like, Chris? Don't tell them at who is Chris or um, who is Chris.com. Don't tell nobody. Nobody yeah. read Chris's recent article. Carlalexander.ca. Um, you talk about wanting to level up, just go read something that Carl wrote and you're going <laughs> to be forced to level up instantaneously. Uh, PHP plus two auto automatic, right? When you play the Carl card. Do I have a Carl card here? Hold on. No, no, that's a Norcross card. That increases caffeination levels plus two. Uh, here it is, Carl card. I happen to see a pile of uh, work in Miami yeah. cards. Right, when you play this card, it gives you PHP plus five. Yes. 